Okay, so, so today's topic is a leap in consciousness. Uh, Gene Gepster and the Integral World. So um, I have a couple of sheets. Uh, I only printed out about 10, so if you wanted to pass these around um, as many people as they can get <laughs> or share, of course. Um, and th the material on that sheet will make a little bit more sense as we go through this. It's kind of something you can take away and, and uh, I refer to shorthand about the topic. So Gepster. Um, Gepser is the guy who wrote this book, uh, The Ever-Present Origin. He wrote many books, but this is one of the few that's in the English language. And he was a philosopher, a phenomenologist of consciousness, uh, and a poet. And um, what's interesting about Gepser is that he lived during, let's say, let's 1905 to 1973. So he was really alive in the first the first half of the century, uh, sort of where his, his, he really shined with his publications and writing. Um, and he, was, he lived through two world wars. He lived through so much change in Europe. He was born in, in Austria and kind of moved around Europe during the wars to escape uh, you know, particular regimes. Um, so he was interested in what he perceived as a kind of transformation of culture and art. And if you think about all of the artistic movements and the literary movements in the 20th century, from you know, Dada to surrealism uh, to so many others, he, f he intuited something was going on with, with uh, Europe and Western consciousness. But it kind of it broadened his horizons because it made him think, well, if there's a transformation taking place now, have there been transformations in the past? So this book, when he became known for is this kind of sweeping evolution of consciousness, of the, these structures of, of consciousness. Um, this is just one of his poems. Um, he was a poet as well, and he loved the poetry of Rilke. Uh, and just a little overview here. Um, he, in his early years, he was a scholar of Rilke. So he wrote about Rilke and what Rilke was doing with the German language that was so new, and how he was changing you know, the grammar of the German language and the grammar of contemporary literature. Uh, he was friends with the poet Lorca, if you've heard of Lorca. Um, and he was a contemporary of other evolution of consciousness thinkers and mystics, like Teilhard de Chardin, who was a Jesuit priest, and Sri Aurobindo, who was the um, uh, Indian yogi and philosopher. So he, he was kind of, he didn't know them personally, but he did um, kind of discover the work after he wrote this book and made a nice little mention of them. Um, just a little bit of an expanded uh, biography. We can talk about that later, or you can refer to it later if you're curious about some of his other uh, publications during his lifetime. Um, but suffice to say, moving through Europe, going to Spain with Lorca, following the footsteps of the poet Rilke, um, as he's trying to articulate this kind of intuitive mystical insight into consciousness, was a very formative aspect of his life and helped him write this book. Uh, here is the book, of course, 1949, um, came out in two editions. And so he kind of opens, and uh, I've whittled this down a little bit since the last talk because there's just so much material. This is a book, maybe I should say at the outset, that you can, you can read for, for decades, for, for years, and still glean new things from it, and still kind of um, be processing and digesting it and seeing it in a new way. So it's just one of those books, like and thinkers like like uh, like Jung, like um, uh, any of these like philosopher yogi mystics that you kind of have to keep revisiting. Uh, so he writes, the present book is in fact the account of the nascence of a new world and a new consciousness. It is based not on ideas or speculations, but on insights into man's mutations from its primordial beginnings up to the present on perhaps novel insights into the forms of consciousness manifest in the various epochs of mankind, insights into the powers behind their realization as manifest between origin and the present, and active in origin and the present. We're going to go into that. Um, so if there's one, if there's a few orienting questions that will guide you through this uh, talk and through the book, uh, this is basically what Gepser was asking. So. Um, how has our experience of space and time changed? So how do we experience space? How do we experience times? How have these changed? How, and, and, and what are those changes like? What are they qualitatively? So that's sort of his approach. Um, and so Gebser looks at art and language. Um, 
and specific shifts. And he's very good. And if you read the book, and we're going to go through some very concrete examples, uh, he he's always using art. He's always using language and literature and trying to read the changes directly. Because I think as a kind of phenomenologist, which is sort of the study of being, he's interested in art and what it says about being. How, how are we being in the world? How do we experience time? How do we experience space? And what can the artist and what can the individual who's experiencing the art kind of discern through their own experience? Like stepping through, you know, um, uh, if, you, if you've gone to New York, you know, walking through a kind of medieval museum um, and then walking to, you know, the MoMA and walking through that kind of art and seeing Picasso versus seeing a kind of, you know, classical medieval art. There's a very different consciousness going on. And so the Gepster was so interested in what those were and what those qualities were. And um, so this is kind of a, where we can start and where he starts the book as well. So he writes that clearly discernible worlds stand out whose development or unfolding took place in mutations of consciousness. And he develops these three um, um, words. Before he came up with these structures we're going to go into, he developed these things, the pre-perspectival, the unperspectival, and the aperspectival. And it sounds more complicated really than it is. Um, pre-perspectival is before we had a sense of realistic time-space, of the Renaissance painters. We had things like this, which were nevertheless tremendously potent and powerful expressions of, of spiritual energies, of uh, nature, of, of uh, perhaps even gods. So, so we start with this kind of, and this is 17,000 BC uh, in La Salle Cave in France. We start with this kind of pre-perspectival, you know, we don't really have a realistic sense of depth and space, and instead there's a kind of intensity of presence. And the cave, of course, if you're gonna, we're going to talk about space, is the medium for our primordial origins. The cave is so important for kind of creating this, this um, archaic form of consciousness. There's a Chauvet cave in France as well, 30,000 BC. Um, and if you notice, you know, the, the art, there is a, they kind of merge and shift into each other. It's a kind of artwork you don't see until, until modern day with sort of the psychedelic art, right? And the kind of shimmering, trying to express what you see in, in an altered state. And of course, there have been scholars who say that perhaps these were created for altered states. And whether or not uh, entheogens or psychedelics were used, it's still kind of interesting um, and certainly an altered state to go into a cave. Uh, and if you, if you know, you know, if you've ever walked into a cave, it is kind of like going into the unconscious. It is kind of uh, an altered state. Um, and of course, in those days, the cave was a space of ritual. We didn't, we didn't live in the caves. So it had a kind of sacred uh, ontology or, 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 or nature to it, to partake in it. Um, and of course, the space as cave, this kind of pre-perspectival space as cave, carried on actually into early civilization. This is Katal Huyuk. Um, it's in modern day Turkey. And this is from about 7500 BC. And what's interesting about their, their homes, actually, is that you had to climb up to the roof to get in and descend into, into the home. And uh, there's a lot of images, actually, that they've recovered, um, archaeologists, of, of a bison and, and or, you know, the game and the hunt. And there's, I don't have a picture of it here, but I kind of wish I put it up. There's actually um, an interesting, I don't know if you would call it a remnant of the kind of hunter-gatherer age, but they found a wall with a bunch of men running and chasing, you know, some, some giant animal. And even within civilization, we kind of carry forward this sort of hunter-gatherer consciousness. Uh, but again, the, the space as cave is kind of the, the quality, the nature of this early structure. Um, so yeah, pre-perspectival pre world, spiritual realities dominate, and there's an intensity of energies and animals, and the animal world is important. You don't see many images of humans in these caves. Most of them are animals. And occasionally there's a kind of half human, half animal sh shaman or you know, in, you know, a healer who's doing something with the hunt, but for the most part it's, it's buffalo, mammoths, lions, all sorts of stuff. Um, the non-human world is kind of so vibrant and we really, none of us really know or really uh, 
can experience that because we've been raised in civilization. We've been raised with cities and towns and nation states and written languages, you know, for generations, for eons by now. Uh, it's difficult to kind of take your, your, your mind, your consciousness out of that and go to a place in which there was no city. There, was ne there were no cities. There were perhaps gatherings and tribes, but your, your entire consciousness and the language and the images you use to make sense of the world and have a sense of, um, uh, you know, spirit is, is through the natural world. So, and I have this image here, this is uh, in, uh, I think it's in Spain. Um, the cave carries forward, the, the, the idea of the cave carries forward into, um, into the medieval ages and many, many, many classical civilizations as a kind of chamber or space that's important. Um, so this is another aspect of this early pre-perspectival consciousness that Gebser talks about is this dolmen architecture. So we have the vaults, we have the cave, which is kind of the womb, and then we also have a more masculine aspect, which is the, the kind of phallic stones. And we don't really know what these were necessarily used for. Some were tombs, others were perhaps uh, spaces for ritual, but it's kind of interesting how they are cross-cultural. This one's from Korea, this one's from India, this one's from Ireland. Um, so, and again, these kind of carry forward with the columns and the vaults. And Gebser makes uh, the good point that this is kind of related to sort of the masculine feminine, the aspects of gender filling up and kind of forming the world that we live in. Um, this is a good example from, let's see, I guess it's also from Spain, 10th century. Uh, it's, it's the idea of the, the vault and the, and the phallus together. And you see this not only in European medieval structures, but of course in the Islamic world and many other civilizations. So, um, kind of jumping a little forward now, this is, again, you see the column and you see the vault, but this, it's this idea that um, the world is, is not the way we would paint a landscape. The world is instead a kind of world as cave in which spiritual energies are kind of looming over us and sig uh, signifying importance. Owen Barfield is another philosopher of consciousness and he called this the original participation. It's the idea that the imagination and human consciousness uh, were, were, were identified with each other. So a lot of the paintings and a lot of the images in, in uh, classical civilizations were trying to portray this. Even so much so that a lot of the figures, the spiritual figures painted and a lot of these images are, are gigantic. They're bigger than the normal mundane people. Um, and they don't always fit. I mean, it looks like if, she's, if Mary here stands up, this is uh, the Annunciation, if Mary stands up, she might hit her head on the ceiling. Um, so, so again, the, the world is, is the world as cave to the sort of pre-perspectival consciousness. Um, it's kind of interesting in this image, actually, we have uh, the, a painted ceiling of, of stars. So. Uh, again, it's this kind of idea of the kind of imaginal world space as a kind of cocoon around us, which we had not yet emerged into the modern scientific perspectival consciousness, which is not necessarily better, um, as Gebser will, will certainly bring up. Um, and I just note this here, because we're going to come back to this later, this sort of ray of light and some of the background here. There's a little angel hanging out in the bushes, and I think that's, that's Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the garden. So everything is a kind of, the world is full of um, allegory, symbol, image, archetypal meaning. Yeah, so this is Gebser kind of try, succinctly saying what I was just trying to say. Mm -hmm. A yet spaceless, self-contained, and deathless world, significant for its symbolic content and not for what we today would call its realism, these pictures of an unperspectival era are, as it were, painted at night when objects are without shadow and depth. Here, darkness has swallowed space to the extent that only the immaterial psychic component could be expressed. So, um, now Gebser mentions um, pre-perspectival and unperspectival. They're kind of related. Um, I've been trying to figure out what he specifically means by the two, but I, I at least know that unperspectival is probably talking about when we started painting these images in the classical civilizations. We didn't have, we were, we were deliberately using like kind of two-dimensional world spaces for our artwork um, rather than kind of not even distinguished yet. Um, so, perspectival is stepping out of the cave. It's, it's coming out of that kind of twilight consciousness into, into a kind of waking consciousness. And we'll go into that a little bit too, towards the end. So this is um, just an image of uh, one of the yeah, reconstruction of Jerusalem, so late uh, Middle Ages. And 
you're kind of noticing that there's more of an expression of and they're still they're still kind of unrealistic tall people but um there's still there's an expression of depth there's an attempt to begin to articulate space to to uh to begin to depict buildings realistically and this is interesting because it kind of um and Gebser are bringing this up for, uh, for every age, but particularly the Renaissance, because he had the access to a lot of that in Europe's libraries. Um, individuals who are possessed by this, this shift in consciousness, individuals who want to express it, uh, usually they're artists or mystics, and they, they, they're kind of taken by, as Jung would say, an archetype, and they have to learn how to express it. So, um, yeah, a new psychic awareness of space, objectified or externalized from the psyche out into the world begins. A consciousness of space whose element of depth becomes visible in perspective. Uh, and there's a couple of other interesting notes here um, during the Dark Ages, uh, Medieval Ages, that we can bring up. The, the troubadours and their usage of I in romantic poetry were shifting away, and I didn't really mention this before, but were shifting away from a kind of collectivist consciousness into the individual from the kind of group twilight world is cave to the individual who's waking up to the perspectival world so we have again the artists who are singing about their, their adoration the, uh, of love you know perhaps unrequited love but it's, it's sort of an expression of the individual's ego and sense of self-worth and sense of love and romance so there's there's that um, as many people have written, as Jung has also written, there's a retreat of the psychical world into the domain of the unconscious. So the archetypes start showing up you know, through psychology, which would come much later. Um, our new emphasis on individuality, individuality and the subjective self. Uh, we see humanism, and of course, you know, the importance of the eye in perspectival thinking and naturalism with the lens and the microscope. So this is all kind of coming online at the same time. Uh, we had people developing lenses for you know looking at microscopic bacteria and that kind of thing, but we also have people creating telescopes to see space like we've never seen it before. And of course that required a new sense of math, a new sense of space, a new sense of depth. Um, we have the shattering of course of the um, of the uh, um, geocentric view of the universe where Earth is the center and everything is revolving around us. We have that shift over to the heliocentric, and we're going to get into that later. But um, yeah, development of linear time. Uh, the first public clock went online, went online, uh, in Westminster Palace in 1283. Um, but it's, it's um, there's a connection there, actually. Uh, but yeah, development of linear time is another big thing. In space, as, a, as an individual, in, in physical space, time and linear time and progression and clocks and all these sorts of physicalist, naturalist things become very important. Um, and here's where we're going to see if, if the video works. Um, so this is the famous ascent to Mount Ventoux. And uh, Gebser brings this up in the first part of the book as kind of one of these pivotal moments, the discovery of space. And what's great about it is that it's a first person letter that you can read. And this, this individual, this guy, Francesco Petrarch, is writing about his, his ascent onto Mount Ventoux. And it's this kind of, today it's a fun little tourist thing. You can probably drive up. Uh, but back then it was kind of perilous and not a lot of people liked to do it and it's like why would you want to go up there so uh, he decided to though he is a painter and he wanted to climb up and he has this kind of religious experience literally a peak experience on the top of this mountain looking down at France and just having a, this kind of visionary state of just falling in love with landscape and falling in love with the land um, but through the letter, it's so interesting. He kind of turns back and forth. He's writing it, I think, to his bishop or, or his, 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 Catholic, his spiritual leader um, in Italy, uh, probably his bishop or priest. And he's kind of apologetically saying this. Like, I, I, feel, I felt sinful, like falling in love with the land. I should be reading the Bible. I should be turning to the words of God and not focusing so much on, on land for itself and its own beauty. Um, interestingly, it gets her notes that this is actually the site of the troubadours and the Gnostic Cathars. Uh, so there's a kind of, I don't know how you want, much you want to read into that, but there's a kind of link here to sort of the heretical thinkers who kind of foreshadowed a lot of um, the humanist renaissance uh, magic and humanist renaissance not, uh, Gnostics, but magicians and Christian magicians and alchemists and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, Gebser writes, Un unperspectival ties are severed, space as reality. And this is him, this is, this is Petrarch, actually. Um, so, shaken by the unaccustomed wind and the wide, freely shifting vistas, 
I was immediately awestruck. God and my companion are witnesses that my glance fell upon the passage. He had a copy of the Bible and I think a St. Augustine book as well. And men went forth to behold the high mountains and the mighty surge of the sea and the broad stretches of the rivers and the inexhaustible ocean and the paths of the stars and doing so lose themselves in wonderment. I was irritated for having turned my thoughts to mundane matters at such a moment for even the pagan philosophers should have long taught me that there is nothing more wondrous than the soul and that compared to it greatness uh, compared to its greatness nothing is great so it's this idea that he's retracting inward he's going no 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 the world of the soul is is what's beautiful not not what i'm perceiving here so let me see if this actually works um and if it doesn't that's okay but it would be nice to kind of get a little literally a view okay Yes. Good. I can just move this right here. And let me just see if the audio works. I have those iPhone speakers. Might need it in a sec. Yeah. Also, gonna check here. Oh, here we go. So this is just a kind of little soundscape journey. This is Mount Ventu. For a, I think a drone. Music selection is um, from the Cave of Forgotten Dreams. It's an excellent Werner Herzog uh, documentary, but it just kind of works. of that song, it was just kind of a little side note, the Herzog documentary is this beautiful, I recommend it, it's on Netflix, it's been on Netflix for like seven years, thankfully, so I revisit it once a year or so, um, and it's, 
it's about the Chauvet cave and it's about kind of going down there and its whole history and it's one of the very interesting ones because it hasn't it hadn't been touched for you know 17,000 years or so until a, a part of the rock face collapsed um, and and was able they were able to get in so um, it's it's quite interesting there's there's handprints and it's just a very meditative a documentary. I really recommend it, especially after we go through this. You're going to probably want to really connect with the with these structures of consciousness in yourself. Um, so after watching that, this is what Gebs are saying about about uh, Petrarch. The old world where only the soul is wonderful and worthy of of contemplation, as expressed succinctly in Augustine's words, "Time resides in the soul now begins to collapse." There is a gradual but increasingly evident shift from time to space until the soul wastes away in the materialism of the 19th century, a loss obvious to most today that only the most recent generations have begun to counter in new ways. And he's writing that in 1949, which I think is interesting. And this is the same artist who painted that other image of the Annunciation, but this is a little bit later in his life, and uh, Fra Angelico. And um, if you notice, uh, there's, there's an absence of that kind of immaterial divine light. There's, a, there's no more vaulted, there's no more painted ceiling, there's no more stars on the ceiling, and there's more perspective. There's this, win this little window here, you can kind of like follow through to the garden behind, and the Garden of e Eden with Adam and Eve and the angel are, are nowhere to be seen. Um, also, it kind of looks like perspective perspectively, they're a little bit more realistic in terms of their size. So, when you read Gepser, you really kind of begin to pay attention to these little details in the kind of artistic biographies of these historical figures to begin to go, okay, there's something going on with this person, this individual that I'm contacting through their art, and then I can kind of encounter that change in them as well. Um, so there's this kind of gradual attempt to express space. And you know, we take it for granted today, but at the time it was, it was extremely powerful and world-changing. You know, that's a good, good uh, question. I, I feel like that's some kind of, um, I, I didn't read anything about it when I was looking at this image, but it, it might be some kind of aid to help create space or something like that, you know. Um, probably not, not meant to be in the finished product. Can I make one comment? Mm -hmm. um, at least one person that I've known that has seen angels, or at least believes they've seen angels, has said that they are huge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about Mary, but um, yeah, I find that to be really interesting too, as a kind of biblical thing with the you know, giant angels. Again, it's it's attempting through um, through these ancient languages to express the spiritual magnitude of this being. Were they literally giants? Maybe too. Maybe that's how you know we our consciousness perceives something of such spiritual potency and power. Um, how it translates into your you know physical perception. Uh, this is uh, one of the first books on perspective. Um, perspective theory in Leon Battista Alberti's Della Pittura. So it's this idea of how to create depth in paintings. This, we have to understand, this was never written about before. This was never articulated before. So we have these artists, and you know, in the 20th century, there's quite a few manifestos and, you know, about a particular art movement and how to do it. Um, uh, this is kind of like one of those things from 1436. And of course, I already kind of mentioned some of these. There's Copernicus, right? He shatters geocent uh, geocentrism, discovers uh, this heliocentric solar system. Columbus goes beyond you know, the encompassing oceans and discovers Earth's space. Vesalius, the first anatomist, bursts the confines of Galen's ancient doctrines on the, doctrines on the human body. Uh, Harvey destroys the receipts of Hipp Hippocrates, Hippocrates, Hipp yeah, Hippocrates, right? <laughs> Humoral medicine and discovers the circulatory system. So even the body moves from this kind of imaginal thing with, with kind of sympathetic and magical resonance where, you know, organs and humors, which in, in one way is very insightful, um, opens up to modern medicine and anatomy. Discover the body of space. Um, so yeah, yeah, all of this, all of this, uh, the elliptical orbits and Kepler is another guy who, who figured out um, uh, there's some of the early earlier Greek figured this out too. They started to have some early theories about um, uh, geocent heliocentrism, but uh, it wasn't fully expressed. Um, but it's not linear, you know. Things can kind of foreshadow in uh, the future as well. So this is a few other examples, you know, 
Galileo, um, and then we see the beginning of colonialism and the mercantile class, the breaking away from the kind of static war medieval world of the king and the serf, and this kind of, you know, the divine right of kings gets pushed aside for parliaments and, and monarchical, mar monarchical constitutions. Uh, Christianity is another kind of breaking open um, with Protestantism and the rise of all of these different movements and sects. And on one hand, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's an, uh, Gepter doesn't really go into this too much because it's more of a media studies thing, um, but the, the arrival of the printed word was so important for Protestantism and this idea of the, following the letter and following the word um, and not just, you know, relying on the priestly class to do the reading for you was revolutionary. So it's about revolution, emancipation, um, fragmentation as well, but with that comes this kind of, expression of the self and and Gebser kind of talks about the negative of this at this point eager hypertrophy ego hyper hypertrophy the exaggeration of the eye becomes a problem as we we, we start to see um can i add something about the mm -hmm. christian fragments um the scots were essentially peasants they they kept pigs in their in their homes i mean they were so i don't know what the word would be rural beyond rural and I think it was Calvin that brought them the, the Bible. And within four generations, they, they, they could read. They had never even been to the outside world, basically. So, you know, the Nordics mm -hmm. came. Um, and from there, they became, of course, that's where the Presbyterian Church grew. And from there, um, Locke and, and people like that. So that was a very important um, that's just an example, I'm sure, yeah. but um, mm. just trying to illustrate your mm. example. Thank you. Uh, oh, overtly as well, too, it showed in the church where you had the uh, the priest would have his back to the congregation. Around right about that time, he turned around and he was facing the congregation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's a great observation as well. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the, we see all of this. <coughs> Interesting stuff, but there's problems, of course, with this. You know, the, the divided Christian Occident, the Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War. Europe kind of starts erupting into this kind of violent um, segmentation. Uh, yeah, the process of segmentation led to the contemporary state. The narrow specialization and the great achievements of the contemporary world. Ma a man with tunnel, tunnel vision. So we see this in academia today with specialization, of course. Um, the ties to the past, the religio, which literally means to tie back the word itself, religio, are almost non-existent, having been severed, as it were, by the cutting edge of the visual pyramid. And just to get that image, that's the visual pyramid. Your eye is looking at the event horizon, and the pyramid of perspectival space is all there is. So it's this kind of sh this narrowing into materialism, moving away from the kind of imaginal twilight world into the waking world with this kind of pyramidic... Uh, structure of, of, of vision and the eye is important of course as we were mentioning um, so uh, then we move on to a perspectival and maybe after this take a little break or do, keep going okay okay um, so this is where we're going going to the contemporary world so uh, Gebser describes if, if perspective was about the eruption of space and the expression of space and the material reality uh, for the aperspectival, for this new world, it's the concretion of time. It's, it's the expression of time. Not, not clock time, but something else. Time is something else. And this is very big in Gebser's thinking, that time is this kind of multidimensionality. So only where time emerges as pure present and is no longer divided into its three phases of past, present, and future is it concrete. That's kind of a, a statement that can take you through the whole book. Um, so... Uh, here is Picasso, and it meant, a lot of the examples in Gebser's book, of course, are from the early 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, because that's when it was written. Um, and what I'm doing in my own work is kind of looking at, well, what else happened? You know, what's happening today, which might be an expression of the of the aperspectival. Um, but at the time, uh, Picasso was very important, um, and uh, Gebser goes into quite a bit of detail about how um, there's there's movement in this image. There, you have to understand for, for a few centuries at this point, we've had this continued, uh, you know, depicting realistic paintings and anatomy and the sciences and naturalism. There's this direction towards, you know, as realistic as possible, exploring space, exploring depth. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, the 1800s, mid 1800s or so, going into the 20th century, um, then there's a kind of eruption of new art. So when you look at this image of, of this person, it's as if they're standing this way, as if they're facing you, as if you're able to kind of see them as a whole. You're able to see their movement as a whole, the front, back, and center, uh, and something about their character is present there. And so Gebser no noted this as a kind of, something is happening here. There is a shift in our consciousness. We are trying to express temporicity and time in our artwork. Um, so yeah. He's talking about this, and I kind of go into this a little bit so it can kind of anchor us in this, because it gets a little weird now. Um, in this drawing, space and body have become transparent in the sense that drawing is neither unperspectival, a two-dimensional rendering, uh, nor is it perspectival, a three-dimensional uh, visual sector cut out of reality. Um, the drawing is aperspectival in our sense of the term. It is no longer, no longer spatialized, but integrated and concretized as a fourth dimension. This renders visible whole visible to insight, a whole which becomes visible only because the previously missing component, time, is expressed in an intensified and valid form as the present. The drawing, uh, the pure present, the quintessence of time that radiates from this drawing. So again, it's this idea that time brings wholeness brings presence, and it's not linear time, it's presence, which you can see past, present, and future, the whole being existing and in, in being. Um, and there's, of course, more examples here. There is the Surrealist movement, uh, the Cubist movement, and those sorts of things. Here's Dali. Um, it's kind of an interesting image. I only picked it because of how striking it is, the kind of world is an egg. Um, but we see this kind of eruption of the psyche, and of course, we're going to go into this uh, when we go into the specific structures that are on the sheet, um, uh, time is uh, is in the unperspectival world and the preperspectival as that kind of like calendrical astro astrological system of, of circular rhythm, right? Time is is of the soul. There is an aspect of time that is of the soul. Um, so that we have this kind of eruption back of the of the unconscious, kind of breaking forth space and kind of doing weird stuff in a dreamlike way. Um, this of course, expresses time and expresses a lot of things. Uh, perhaps we can't really articulate all the things it expresses, but um, there's certainly a sense of time here, but maybe even more so here, where it's almost as if you're kind of looking at a person doing, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 things all at once. And there's just expressions and dimensions that you're kind of able to perceive in the present, but it's a multi-dimensionality and not just a three-dimensional image. So multidimensionality is a kind of way to understand what, what's kind of breaking forth in the early 20th century. What, what was that first painting? Oh, sorry. That one was um, Jean Metzinger, La Femme à Cheval, Woman with a Horse. Thank you. Yeah. The, the second one, the Dali, is a, real, is a very good example of what we were trying to say, because you see the embryonic human there, mm -hmm. and then above the, the foreshadowing of death, perhaps. Yeah, this is 1943, so right in the World War II. Yeah. So. So this the uh, foreshadowing of the world. Yeah. This is a kind of multidimensional expression of, of that says so much, you know. And, and pointing is, is is life, the gestation of which being the very core of, of meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the far right figure, the more automatic yeah. man. Little you know, baby. He's, he's telling us what what to look at here. Yeah. You know, look at the, the gesture of life yeah. struggling to become. It's a very beautiful image, very striking. Uh, so yeah, Expressionism, Cubism, Fauvism, Surrealism, these are just examples of early 20th century artistic movements that are breaking up space. They are breaking up the perspectival world and, and, and erupting with the psyche, again, erupting with time. Uh, the return of intensity, you know, Impressionist paintings, there's a kind of spiritual energy to them. There, there's a kind of presence as you begin to encounter them. Uh, so, so there's this kind of presence that begins. And I brought in Kandinsky here, a theosophist. Um, but this one I thought was a kind of fun. This is sort of the eruption of space. Because it's kind of even using space, but in a kind of platonic way. And, and, and it's using it in a completely different way. This is, you see, the, you see the perspectivalism, right? You see the geometries. But they're used in a kind of way that, you know, it's bringing forth intensities and energies. Um, and from the little bit that I know about Kandinsky, he has a kind of theory of forms and shapes that uh, he takes from uh, adapts from uh, theosophy. And uh, I'm pretty sure he's grounded in kind of esoteric traditions as well, and platonic traditions. So 
um, he was doing a lot of other interesting stuff here, a lot of mystical stuff with, with this kind of uh, uh, play with space. Um, interestingly, he also had a, a theory of uh, images, shapes, and colors, and a synesthetic theory. So again, it's this idea of the non-rational, uh, the, the um, irrational as a kind of type of knowledge that we needed to embrace and, and integrate. Um, so, uh, do we want to keep going for, or do we want to, 2.52, so. Okay, let's go 10 more minutes. So this is the st uh, structure. So the first part of the book, um, the perspectivals, the on, the pre, the a, they're all earlier expressions for Gebser himself writing in the 30s um, and culminating in this book. But uh, he wrote a few books before this using those terms. And that was kind of a way for him to, to understand the general broad strokes. Um, he goes back and he's able to kind of add more distinctions into history. A little bit more of, okay, so what's the difference between uh, the medieval paintings that we showed and the paintings at Chauvet Cave? Because there is one. There's a different consciousness operating. They may be within the unperspectival, but they're a little bit different, a little bit distinguished. Um, and then this is just kind of quintessential gaps are there. Before we can discern the new, we must know the old. So in terms of theory, in terms of what is trying to express, um, and we could take away at least on paper. He sees consciousness as this whole. So the aperspectival, that wholeness that has that multidimensionality of time, the past, present, and future in it, it's this kind of origin, he calls it. And he associates it with the spiritual. He sometimes calls it the itself. He's quite a mystical figure himself um, in, in his terminology and his attempts to express what this is. Uh, he felt this multidimensionality in Rilke's poetry, and he thought Rilke was an expression of the a perspectival as well. Um, yeah, and all time forms are latent in origin, the past, present, and the future. And basically, he sees history as this kind of movement of consciousness as it attempts to express aspects of itself creatively, struggling to realize it in the world, like those artists, like those individuals, like those civilizations. And these leaps, they're kind of creative leaps, um, that we've seen in some of these paintings, uh, they're called mutations. So he uses the word mutation because a mutation is discontinuous. It's, it's, he doesn't want to fall into the trap of painting this history as this linear progression because that's the perspectival, that's movement through space, that's clock time. He's saying, no, 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 there's, a, there's more dimensionality to transformation than that. And we have to challenge ourselves by, by not resorting to linear developmental um, maps. He goes along a uh, couple pages kind of really laying into that critique. Um, and, you know, he was also writing this in the mid 20th century after uh, World War II. Uh, so he was very critical of this sort of modernist, positivist agenda of history because he thought it was kind of leading towards catastrophe. But he wasn't a pessimist, which is what I like. He was, a, he was very critical and he gives, instead of just tearing down, you know, modernity and positivism and the progression of history, he gives you something else. Um, so yeah, these mutations, they're spiritual, they're not biological or historical in the sense of you know, linear history, even though they do happen with a kind of unfolding dimensionality. Um, yeah, these are spiritual qualities of consciousness, intensification, expansion, and dimensionality. They're discon discontinuous and linear, and they live in us, they don't go away. So the, what you saw in those caves and the structure of the people in the caves are still within us. They may be more latent, but they're still within us. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're talking about that leap. And then, let's see if there's anything else here. We can skip that. Yeah, interesting note here. Um, he talks about these structures. So you, you begin with that kind of twilight consciousness. You emerge into the waking, the waking perspectival space. But in, in doing so, you may have noticed we kind of lost that inner world. We kind of lost the world of the soul and spiritual realities and the kind of animism of, of uh, the archaic consciousness and the, the sort of magical, sympathetic cosmology of, of the medieval age. Was, it was beautiful, and there are plenty of people talking about it today and how you know, important that is. So for Gebser, you know, we don't always 
it's not linear. When we, we progress through these structures, sometimes we lose things. And it's this whole idea that only the sort of integral, a perspectival consciousness can kind of render it all whole and not sort of throw away the magical twilight caves um, and embrace science or vice versa. Uh, so that's sort of the important thing here. And I just have like an overview. Here are the structures. And if you're going to kind of use what we were just using to understand this, these are, this would be unperspectival, this would be pre, no, this would be pre, this would be un, and then we get perspectival, and then we get aperspectival. So there's the kind of directionality here. Um, yeah, so let's start with, with archaic. Um, so dreamlessly the men of earlier times slept, and that's a Taoist quote that Gebser uses to describe them. And it's really difficult to describe the archaic because it's, it's the furthest back, I mean, in, term, times of, in terms of linear time, it's the furthest back we can go. Um, so we don't really have much knowledge about it. Was it the Chauvet paintings in the cave? Was it something even perhaps before that? Uh, I like to associate it with, with um, because the earliest expressions of art in human consciousness date back to 50 to 40,000 years ago, as far as we know. And I like to just kind of, if we're going to pin it in linear time, I kind of just use that as a placeholder. The eruption of artistic consciousness in humanity, to me, is sort of, you know, uh, Gebser describes origin and, and uh, the spiritual in the itself as creative. Uh, so I just kind of associate it with the eruption of art is what makes the archaic archaic. Um, this is a sort of our original participation, the complete identity of humanity and the world in this kind of creative expression. Um, there are mythical allusions to this with the androgene, the primal man, and the proto-anthropos. These are kind of, in the classical world, this idea of Plato that there is this, um, I think it's the next image here, the myth of Aristophanes. And it's this like, he's, it's both genders, and it's this kind of soul being which expresses both. So it's this kind of union, this wholeness, this identification with the world, and identification with origin. Spiritual presence radiates and is just transparent to, to all beings, just kind of in this structure. And again, we don't know really when this was. It's kind of, it's, it's beyond our literal perspectival event horizon of history. Um, so then we move on to magic, and this is where things get a little bit more familiar, and we can kind of hold on to them a little bit more with examples. Uh, the etymology of magic is, is make, mechanism, machine, and might, which is interesting, and they play a role. Um, it's no longer being completely suffused in the world, but having a world. Um, and in terms of dimensionality, Gesser says it's, it's, one, it's, it's single dimensionality. It's one point stands for the whole. And we can understand this because with magic, of course, that's, that's what sympathetic resonance is. You know, your ritual has everything to do with what's going to happen tomorrow or what happened in the past as a kind of resonance of one point with all points. Um, yeah. Magic man's reality, his system of associations are these individual objects, deeds, or events separated from one, one another like points in the overall unity. Um, this idea that the macro and the micro are whole. No, it's okay. In the whole is the microcosm, and all points are interchangeable with unity. Um, this is a kind of group consciousness. It's an egoless consciousness. Uh, you can see this in a lot of in indigenous cultures, but it's, it's different. It's more complex because of you know, all the history that's happened in interaction. Um, but it's this kind of idea that even humans exist in this kind of collective psyche. The ego hasn't congealed around the individual, and instead it's a person who participates with the tribe and the, and the myths of the tribe and the spiritual resonance with nature. And uh, this is just another image from Lasso Cave. It's this kind of magical resonance. People uh, think that this was some, used in some kind of hunting ritual. Um, interestingly, the, sh the shaman man has got like a duck or animal head, and possibly an erection there, and he's got a little a staff with a duck, and I don't know what's going on here, but there's an image of an arrow, um, uh, that's an arrow right there. So this has to do with the hunt, and it looks like some kind of ecstatic state of union with the hunt. And uh, there, there is evidence that um, there was a ritual before, before a hunt happened where they would throw spears at the cave wall, at this animal, and sort of enact what would be tomorrow today. And again, it's that idea that this ritual is connected to tomorrow's hunt. So there is no, there's no really sense of linear time in that, in that kind of way. Um, and magic doesn't work like that. Um, just another image of Chauvet Cave with, again, this kind of possibly some kind of ritualistic 
expression. And again, there's this kind of interlinking connectivity with all the animals. Yeah, all magic even today occurs in the natural, vital, vital, egoless, spaceless, timeless sphere. This requires, for us at least, a sacrifice of consciousness. It occurs in a state of trance when the consciousness dissolves as a result, as a result of mass slogans or isms. Um, and he was talking about this in terms of uh, the World War II and, and, and fascism and nationalism and these kind of magical revivals in, in the negative, in the deficient form, because we had been suppressing them for so long with rationality. Um, and here's more examples. This is not from uh, ever-present origin, but he used a few like this that I couldn't find online. Um, this is from the tomb of Tutankhamun, but it's this image, and this is a motif, but we should kind of uh, take a little bit more, uh, with more consideration because of the way uh, things are drawn. And it's not just that they're unperspectival, they're also kind of linked together. Everything's kind of in this two-dimensional interlinking consciousness. Uh, this continues on, of course, into the uh, Dark Ages. This is a European. This is from 1300 AD. Uh, I wish I could show you the whole mosaic, but it's a kind of interesting vegetative interlinking of things and human beings in this kind of vegetative space. Of course, by this point, we're a little bit more distinguished. We're standing out more. We're a little bit more even realism. Um, another aspect of, uh, of, of the magic is this idea that sound is important. Acoustics are important. Uh, resonance, the echoing of voices and song and rhythm in the, in the, in the cave chamber, uh, which will relate to the sounds that you hear during the hunt, which will relate to the sounds of nature, the interlinking acoustics of the world. It was more important to hear necessarily than to, to, than to tell the world what's going on. Um, so at least this is Gebser's interpretation of these kinds of early images. This is Venus of Brassenpoi. I forget how old this is, but it's at least you know seven, eight, ten thousand years old. Um, when these probably are as well. These are from Australia, and this is from uh, France. And again, these kind of look like aliens here. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that both of these images don't have uh, mouths. Yeah. So he's just talking about here what we were just saying that that uh, it's more important, the organ is, is um, yeah, the lack of the mouth is a sign uh, that the organ that enables us to articulate is still irrelevant. Communication between members of the group, the we, does not yet as require language, but occurs to a certain extent simul subcutaneously or telepathically. Interestingly, Gebser was writing about this. Back, at, back in the day, it was, I think, a little bit more okay to kind of suppose parapsychological theories, um, at least maybe in the 40s. Uh, but yeah, the egolessness of the individual who is not yet an individual demands participation and communication. So this kind of group vital energy, this sort of group consciousness. And we've, we've all probably experienced this with our families and close friends and, and, and communities to some degree, but it was that much more for the, the magical. Yeah, it is not the sun-related eye, but the labyrinthine ear that is the magic organ, the sun that represents diurnal brightness, whereas the labyrinth represents the cave-like nocturnal darkness of dormant consciousness. So now we're going to move to the mythic. Um, maybe after this, we'll take a break. Uh, seasonal time and rituals, calendrical systems. So the mythic is, is, if we're going to place this in history, it might be the beginning of settlements. It might be the beginning of when we started to grow things and need, needed to pay attention to the rhythms and cycles of nature a little bit even more than we would uh, for you know hunter gatherers, who I'm sure did as well, and this also, of course, pertains to, uh, to hunter gatherers as well. Um, so two dimensions instead of one. Polarities are important. Time is rhythm. Time is rhythmicity. Time is the cycles of the moon, the cycles of the seasons, the ex uh, expansion and contraction, heat and cold, um, the the higher world and the underworld, uh, and there's further differentiation from nature. And I like this image, and this is also used in uh, Ever Present Origin, uh, because it's, it's from uh, um, Crete, and it's the prince with the crown on his feathers, that's, that's what we decided to call it. Um, and the image that Gebser uses is a little different, maybe a different fresco uh, of the same motif, but um, nevertheless, in Gebser's image, the sky has stars. Um, and we have this image of the human being who's standing out from nature. It's the subtleties here. His feet are planted in this vegetation. And in the other painting, um, his torso has like a mountainscape behind it too. It kind of continues. But this is even further uh, to the point. Uh, his head has a crown of feathers. 
not, not reefs and not a garland, not a vegetative consciousness, but an image and a symbol of the soul, an image of something that takes flight and is celestial. And of course, the human being standing in the stars with his crown in the stars is kind of an image of this sort of astrological consciousness, this, this consciousness of the soul. Um, and moving away, breaking away, differentiation, differentiating from the embeddedness and identity with nature. And that's one of the more striking images. Um, yeah, so myth has, uh, etymologically, and Gebser's really good with this too, he goes into the etymology of all of these words, and you know, he's writing in German, uh, but e even more so, he's able to kind of break down interesting things that tell you, 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 you follow etymology and you kind of follow the evolution of consciousness and, and what a word means far enough back. Uh, so myth means mouth, right? And mythos meant speech or word. But mu, to sound, to sound uh, means to sound, but mien means to close, to mute, silent. So it means to speak and also to be silent. There's a polarity in the very word itself, just as there are in, in uh, the mythical structure. And of course, we've mentioned that earth and sky, heaven and the underworld, and the polarities and the dynamics of the soul. Um, this is very important, of course, in, in, in Eastern philosophy with yin and yang, this idea of complementary opposites. They're not, they're not opposing. They work with each other. They're part of this kind of cosmological um, balance. So yeah, the world is always a mirror of inner silence, and myth a reflector of the soul. The blind or unreflective side of the mirror is necessary to produce the visible reflection. Since all psychic phenomena have an essentially reflective character, they do not evidence, they not only evidence natural temporality, but also make reference to the sky. The soul reflects the sky, as well as hell. Thus the cycle, the circle is complete. Time, soul, myth. Heaven and hell, myth, soul, time. So again, it's that idea of the circle. And if there is a dimension here, um, it's two-dimensional, but the image is often a circle, like the mandala. And Jung would, would talk about this quite a lot in sort of the revival of the soul and the image of the soul being the mandala, which is another good connector here to another thinker. Yeah, so let's see if there's anything else I can wrap up with this part. So ego development. Um, a lot of ancient myths start to talk about wrath. Of course, there's the Old Testament, right? The wrathful God. But um, there's a lot of heroes, there's a lot of angry men, there's a lot of angry kings who are Achilles, or they're perhaps half god. Um, an individual who conquers and um, who's on his way to individuation. So, this kind of masculine energy and the sort of development of really the development of patriarchy is, is here in the, in the, um, in the mythical. Uh, there's the ego emergence, and uh, the Bhagavad Gita is a kind of divine sort of like go forth and go fight, go go t play your part in history. Um, and then of course the opening lines of Iliad, sing goddess the wrath of Peleus' son Achilles. So directionality is a foreshadow of the perspectival, which eventually would emerge in the ego and, and, and space. But it's a sort of go forth in space, go forth on the plains of the battlefield kind of idea. Um, so we also have, again, this kind of foreshadowing of, of this perspectival space with the birth of Athena breaking out of the head of Zeus. And it's, again, this idea that, um, that there's a kind of new consciousness erupting, a consciousness of the, the literally like the, the forehead, right? So it's this idea of like this area of the face is sort of kind of like of divine importance. Um, again, foreshadowing the eruption of the mental. Um, so yeah, the mental, we can actually wrap this up and then we can stop at, um, at the integral and finish with the integral. I would like to you know, encourage everyone to ask questions and contribute. We are all learning and, and don't be shy. Great. Um, <clears throat> <It's on. laughs> yeah. This is only a few more slides actually because we went over the perspectival and that's really the mental. Uh, mythology uh, can tell us about the evolution of consciousness and that's sort of a this is sort of what I was saying here about how this myth or how the Iliad is sort of talking about this eruption of the ego and the self. Um, so myth is very helpful for us to understand what's going on, what are the processes, and contemporary myth as well, as we'll go into a little bit after the break. And you might want to define this because after your talk, um, after Stephen's talk, um, and I had a discussion about it, mm. um, and it turns out that Mythos means an, a, a collection of assumptions or belief. It doesn't necessarily mean untruth. Mm -hmm. um, it, so, it, I mean, would you 
Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that. I mean, that's a kind of like before you own it. I mean, myth is sort of that that world of the soul. I mean, it's, it's it's meaning, it's image, it's the presence of the archetypes and the deities, the the kind of psychical drama that like you know the Greek gods we we talk about so much and that Western civilization is kind of obsessed over. Um, and used as a template for understanding psychology. These are these are movements of the soul, you know. Like these are these are these are real in their own way, you know. They're not necessarily like scientifically real, but they're another a aspect. And that's uh, yeah, they might be. I think is yeah. what I'm, I'm mm -hmm. like Steiner would argue that it is real. So there is I mean, a there, yeah. I think it's the root of the truth. Yeah. And that's why we're all yeah. here. So and a lot of folks say, you know, even the myth is is, is realer, the dimension of myth and the imaginal, like Henri Corbin writes about. And the temporal will yeah. not be here in a couple decades. Yeah, there's a maybe, kind of... Maybe myth can help us interpret our dreams, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let me just wrap up here. And, um, yeah, interestingly, just about that Athena myth, this transformation of consciousness. Um, wakening, okay. So Athena is owl-eyed, which I think is interesting. It's being able to see at night. It's being able to see with that, but it, it is kind of like the perfect image for a civilization that's breaking out of the mythical of twilight because it's a being that can just see space in the twilight. It can see through the darkness. Um, and of course, Athens as a city becomes the site of, of you know modern Western thought and Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. and. So it's, it's, got, it's kind of got this locus point of this eruption of, of mental consciousness. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, mental kind of related to ordered by action of men uh, in causal sequence. Uh, Greek, the word etymologically, me mental, menace, means wrath. So again, it's that connection to wrath, directionality. There's a kind of, kind of fervent, furrowed brow looking, you know, that, that's, that's sort of the etymological aspect of the word myth. Um, so that's sort of just reifying that. Um, is it and it, wrath, wrath of the soul or the interaction between gods? I think, it, yeah, the, the directional will. It's, it's kind of a will, you know, like a kind of, kind of force a force from, from the individual to act and do something in the world. Um, and I bring this up very briefly. Um, in the mental, Gebster says that the shape, if we we're going to do it, the shape of the thinking is, is the um, dialectical thinking. The, it's no longer comfortable with paradox or with, with polarities. It has to become intellectual theoretical paradox or it has to move into the sort of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, this kind of logical movement. So there's the beginnings of, uh, of logic and, and more advanced forms of mathematics. but at a mythological level. I'm sorry, logic was, was birthed by the Greeks, is that right? Yes, okay. yes. Um, at, a, at a mythological level, we have Christianity, which is the, tri you know, the early Christianity, Catholicism, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of triune kind of thinking, which breaks the mythical round. It, it sort of pierces the mythical membrane of, of imaginal space and the cave as world. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that the word mythological, myth of logical. Yeah, is in the great point, language. great point. Um, and of course, uh, to conclude the sort of what we were talking about before, the late mental starts, uh, Gebster says with every structure, there's a deficient phase. It starts to kind of not really work very well and it starts to rely on excess to kind of stay in power and in control of the world. So the mental's excess is a mental rational. Uh, the deficient stage, uh, stage, the breaking of everything into splintering ratios and ratios. And, and we we're talking about the kind of Protestant revolution, which was amazing, but then it kind of ended up splitting into all of these different factions warring against each other, abstraction and uh, sort of dissociation. Uh, I, I use poor Descartes here, but, you know, he's kind of this, you know, not sure if he exists kind of in his meditations, his famous meditations. Um, so yeah, atomization, fragmentation, and isolation. You start to fall into a world where that triangle is all there is. It's kind of an escape, an event horizon in which you lose the imaginal realities, you lose the spiritual realities, and you've only got this kind of event horizon onto death and materialism. So there's this kind of anxiety in the modern mental. And uh, Gesser also talks about that a lot. Um, that the mental, we're going to go after the break, but the mental and the late mental is obsessed with time. 
And you know, in the early 20th century, you know, we don't have enough time. There's not enough clock. Time is speeding up. There's this kind of there's a need for a transformation of consciousness, but the mental doesn't have what it takes. So it attempts to kind of grasp it, but in, in doing so, it slips through its fingers. It's so that's the trap. crisis. Yes, it's become a trap and a crisis. Um, and crisis and mutation are, of course, very important dynamics in, in Gebser's thinking. So that's it for now. We have a little break. Let me um, just say that my husband's going to be really upset if you don't eat some of the food in there. <laughs> so please.